Well, ladies and gentlemen, joining us on the phone right now, he is uh, a familiar face to anybody who watched wrestling in the 70s, 80s, 90s. He's a familiar face today, and if you haven't seen him, you should read his book. Ladies and gentlemen, none other than the world's most dangerous ring announcer, Gary Capetta. Gary, thank you for being on the program. James Z, it is great to talk to you, and you are responsible for the moniker, the world. Why did you name me that? Where did did I ever tell you that? I don't think so. I, because the world's most dangerous announcer, because at the time, and I'm a huge David Letterman fan to begin with, but at the time, Paul Schaefer uh, was hosting the, it was uh, leading the world's most dangerous band right. that Letterman turned because Letterman was from Indianapolis and grew up watching Dick the Bruiser, the world's most dangerous wrestler. Right. No, that I understood. But why did you name me the world's most dangerous anything? I'm, I'm like the opposite of that. Because it looked like you were going to hurt yourself, at least, if not somebody else, <laughs> every time that you announced these, especially the main events, when you, you, you kind of, you curled in your, your arms to your sides and bent over a little bit and then expelled all that energy out of the air and you popped up and down like a kangaroo. And See, I that's thought because, that's because I started to announce before electricity. <laughs> <laughs> you really had to project to get it out there in the Roman Coliseum because the lions were so loud when they were roaring. I, but Absolutely. The bullhorn, everything I, I went through. Yeah, it's, that's that old school style. That, yeah, that's the booming style. I, I just thought it was, it was really funny because when you look at GMC in the ring, you know, conservative, serious, you know, it's the antithesis <laughs> of everything dangerous. So I thought it was wonderful. <laughs> well, actually, also, there was the time that I told you, you looked like you just stepped off the top of a wedding cake. <laughs> so there, there was that. And that was, there was, uh, but hey, but before we talk about how all this came to be and you got to be uh, the world's most dangerous announcer, tell people how you're doing now, because we heard on the internet you had a health scare not long ago. You had a heart attack, and and but you are still going on with your planned events. But how 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 are you feeling? How's your health? Oh, I'm all right now. But last week I was in rough shape. You know. Nah, I'm doing fine. I'm doing great. It was uh, um, it wasn't unexpected <laughs> to tell you the truth. You can you can kind of like feel these things coming on. Um, Wait a minute. Tell me exactly how, because I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you you know, you feel a little bit, you know, like tightness in the chest here and there, and then it goes away, and you say, ah, it wasn't anything, and it wasn't anything, and, and my advice would be, don't say it wasn't anything, you know, get checked. Um, the fuck, yeah, I've, no, been I, feel, I've been feeling that for the last 15 years. Uh, I'm fine. So, you know what this, it means that you need to take it easy on me, because GMC can go down at any moment. <laughs> 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 well, you're at least you'll you'll go down on the road doing what you love best. Because tell them tell the people about the tour that you've got coming up. Because you wrote the book uh, yep. a, a while back, and it, it's been out. But if people haven't read it, it's new to them, so they they should get it. Body slams, uh, memoirs uh, of a wrestling pitchman. Yeah, and and they can get that uh, on Amazon and all that stuff. But now you're you're. Uh, you're going on tour with stories from the, the book and kind of dressing it up with a stage show. Yeah. Um, back when the book came out, um, the original book came out, it was self-published in 2000. And I decided, oh, I, I need a way to draw attention to the book. I don't have any platform to do that. So I created this show, which is loosely scripted um, with live giant screen video. Um, and... It's, it's like a wrestling match. It's loosely scripted. I know where I am, where I have to get to, and how I get there every night is different. Um, but I know the topics that I'm, that I'm hitting. Um, and then the, the encore is a, a Q&A with the audience. Uh, it's very interactive. I go into the audience, ask questions, um, share some stories, pay tribute to Gorilla Monsoon, who was my mentor. Um, if it wasn't for... Um, Gino, I would, you know, I mean, I, I had no, no, um, it wasn't like I tried to get into pro wrestling. It wasn't like I wanted to be an announcer. I just wanted to get into the matches for free. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and I had gotten a press pass. I was sitting at ringside and I, they needed an announcer and I got in and I did it. This was 1974. So, you know, it couldn't happen today. And that was the McMahon family. 
you know. <laughs> so it was, it was just, so I, I, I take people through the journey, you know, and we hit NWA, we do some backstage, look at some backstage video of which you are a part of. Um, it was a Great American Bash video from Oakland. Oh, and good I, Lord. I know who sh- Jimmy, Jimmy Garvin shot that. That is correct. Because he, he, he had a new camcorder. I think the Precious had gotten him for whatever. And, and, and we thought, well, this will never be seen in public. <laughs> <laughs> and you go on a riff about uh, how tight Jim Crockett is. And it, <laughs> la- it lasts about, you know, two Now, two wait a minute. You're talking financially. We're talking financially now. How yes. tight Jim Crockett <laughs> yes. is. I don't want people to any unnecessary rumors. And then I take them, you know, through um, WCW and uh, like the day I uh, I interviewed El Gigante um, live in one of the clashes, and he had just arrived, and we were building up to a Great American Bash, and he was part of a six man tag match, so they had me in, uh, interview him in Spanish and simultaneously translate for the people at home as to what he was saying. And I would ask him a question, and he wouldn't give me the right answer. <laughs> so I just made up the answers that he was supposed to give me. So if you didn't speak Spanish, you just thought, well, that's what El Gigante said. And if you were Latino, you're saying, Jesus, that Gary Capetta, he doesn't have a clue he's, to what he... <laughs> he's a lousy translator. <laughs> yeah, he, got, he didn't say that. He got, they didn't say that. <laughs> you know, then I take them on tour a little bit... Uh, uh, the night Mick Foley lost his ear, and the referee flipped it over to me. And what oh my God, that's I- right! Now hold on here. We got to. It won't spoil the show because because many people are going to be out of range. We don't want to piss off the, the. We got a listener in the Isle of Malta. We really do. I've heard <laughs> from him. I know it's a fact. Um, was it tell, Baron Cicluna? <laughs> it was not. It was not the fine Baron. But uh, <laughs> tell it. You were the ring announcer the night the tour in Germany. Yep. And to take people through what exactly happened, because it's not every day you get pitched an ear when you go to work. Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you would, you never know what you're going to do until you're in that situation. Um, but, it, you know, it wasn't a surprise. If you remember, um, Mick's ears were, they were just hanging off his head. <laughs> well, and, just, you know, I, I remember just him. in the breeze, just dangling there. <laughs> I remember uh, bringing him with me to my mom's place in Florida, and his ears were all infected and pussy, and she took some kind of alcohol to clean them out, and he was squealing in her living room. It it was, so it was going to happen. It was just a matter of when and where. Well, the the thing was, because he did that old hangman spot, which... yep. Which is is easy to do, and that's the one thing, the, the ropes above cables on a ring, and the old WWF rings with the ropes, so they still have them, where you can tie up your arms or tie your head in at the old hangman spot. But Cactus was doing that spot with the, the WCW rings had cables, and when he would go over the top and grab the one rope and twist it around his neck, basically he's got now two steel cables tied around the sides of his neck, so the clock is ticking on how long he can stay there <laughs> without passing yeah. out. And yeah, absolutely. And, and he was, it, it, it was wearing on his, his ears probably had, they were probably already, what do they call it? Scored <laughs> or, you know, the, 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 when you tear the bill off, you know, the pay, they were already perforated. They were yeah, ready I, to come. He was taping them down to the side of his head. I mean, <laughs> um, and, and on that particular night, I think it was Scorpio who was out first. We had we didn't have a an American ring crew. We had stagehands from Europe, so they didn't know how to set up a ring. And we did have a couple of referees who knew what they were doing, but eventually they were both sent home uh, for uh, I think there was a, like a medical emergency in one case, and the other guy got sick or something. It was probably Nick Patrick and uh, uh, another Pee Wee Pee Wee Anderson. Yeah, maybe it was Pee Wee. It was either Pee Wee or Mike. So, um, so we had a French referee who didn't speak English, and we had um, we had stagehands from Europe to maintain the ring. So I think it was Scorpio who went out for the first match, and when he came back, he told Flair, who was in charge that night, um, you know those those ring ropes are way too loose. Someone's going to get hurt. So Flair told 
the stagehands to go out and tighten up the ropes. And man, did they tighten up the ropes. <laughs> so when Cactus did that spot, they were extra tight around his neck. Oh, good Lord. So that when he pushed himself through to uh, lower himself to the ground, to the floor, um, they didn't, it didn't come off at that point, but it, it was just hanging. And he got back in the ring. He was wrestling <laughs> Vader. And it was uh, a Euro- they had a European uh, um, tournament. It was, it was a match in the European tournament that was going to continue night after night after night throughout Germany. And uh, so when you come to my show and you look at the video, you see his ear fall off after he gets back in the ring. And they're, you know, they're pounding each other. And you see the referee pick up the ear. And I don't know what's going on. I don't know that he's holding his ear. And he comes over and he starts spouting off in French. I have no idea what he's talking about. Those French, to... those French are big spouter offers, too, I've known. <laughs> and, but I, I did hear the word ambulance, ambulance, ambulance. And I did, you know, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a linguist, so I, I could figure out that was ambulance. <laughs> Please, yeah, that, that's it. I know it's a it's a leap, but you were able to make <laughs> your back multiple linguistics. So, um, so a he, cunning linguist, from what I've heard, Good. he gives it to me, and I know that the only way, the only shot in hell that we have of being able to save the ear, so that it at one point can be reattached to Cactus's head, is to put it on ice. So, uh, you know me, I would never leave ringside. You know, I, I was a steady Eddie, and I was, but in this particular case, I took it to the back. And uh, did, you ha- to- did you have it in your hand, uh, waving it up over your head, like, look out, the ear is coming through. <laughs> no, I, I, it was like laying, I had my hand out flat, and it was laying in my hand. Oh. And because I didn't want to. You know, I didn't want to just smudge it up. I, I don't know. What do, what do you do with an ear? <laughs> yeah, did, you resist, <laughs> did you resist the urge to whisper some sweet nothings in it while it was sitting here? <laughs> so, um, so after I was able to convince Flair that I actually did have a, an ear in my hand. <laughs> because what it was, was that, very was that, no, how, did, how did you how did you present that? Did you say, Rick, here is Mick's ear. I have Mick's ear in my hand. What was the words? That's which exactly what I said. I said it, it was very dark backstage. It was uh, one of those big German sports hallas. And um, every once in a while, there was a downlight in the back. And so I'm essentially in the dark. And Flair, and Flair says to me, what are you doing back here? Because he knew I would never leave ringside. I said to him, Rick, I've got Cactus's ear in my hand. He said, what? I said, I've got Cactus's ear in my hand. He said, are you feeling all right? I, said, I took him by the, the arm and I moved him to underneath one of these down lights. And I said, look, I, we, we have to find ice. I have to put this on ice. And he says, holy shit, that's a human ear. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's what I've been trying to tell you. And Sting heard it, and he was in one of the, uh, one of the side rooms. And he comes out, and he looks at it, and, you know, it was, he just said, wow, that's really cool. Look at, hey, guys, come here, look at this. <laughs> and, the, and the guy's compiling out of the, of the locker room looking at the ear. And uh, I did find the doctor. He was with, um, I think he was with Booker T in one of the um, one of the last locker rooms because this is you know big sports hall, which is a circular. Um, and as I'm going back to the ring, because they he, he they continued to wrestle, and the match had ended. And as I'm going down to the ring, um, Cactus is coming toward me with his hand over where his ear used to be. And he just looks at me, and you know he was in shock. And he just looked at me, as, and he didn't stop. He just kept on walking. But he just said, and I swear to God, Jimmy, he said this, bang, bang, I lost my ear. <laughs> so, so, so those are the kinds of stories that I tell at my stage show. And uh, I, I have a good time, you know, with it, and I love interacting with the people. And uh, we just have a lot of fun. 
only in in wrestling but you you know you mentioned you've been doing this now um on and off mostly on for 40 some years you're like me you're very elderly um <laughs> but yeah. yeah a lot of a lot of people don't realize that you started with the the WWF because they've seen on now on the network all the 80s pay-per-views from WCW and the Clash of Champions and everything are 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 uh, on the air but they don't realize you know you started uh, you had a whole first career as as a WWF announcer as you mentioned Gorilla's protege and and working in the northeast uh, what are what are your some of your favorite memories of those days the uh, before the national expansion and and everything went to hell well, you know what? When I look back, um, I was just so stupid. I was just so unaware. I, I didn't have a clue. Um, it, it took two years from the time that I started before I was allowed in the locker room. You know, I would. I. They, it was just. It was just not a place that a ring announcer would go. I wasn't trusted, and I didn't even understand why. I had not a clue. Um, and Monsoon was always so encouraging. Um, when I had, I volunteered one night to announce cause they didn't have an announcer. I happened to be sitting at ringside cause I had a press pass, which allowed me to get into the matches for free. And, um, in the, uh, on the Jersey shore, there were certain cities where there would be shows every week, every other week, because the population swelled in those towns. So you'd have a different audience every week because people would come in and rent for the week. They'd rent a cottage, and they'd go to the beach, and then they'd go back home. And then a new group of people would come in. So this was Wildwood, New Jersey, every week. I've been there. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. It's a huge beach. Like, the distance between the boardwalk and the ocean is forever. And that that Uh, Wildwood Convention Center, where they'd, they'd run the matches. Right. This was probably the old convention center. But, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> they rebuilt. They built a new convention center. This this place held about uh, tops three thousand people, and um, bleacher seating, you know, for the the cheap seats. Uh, but it was a it was a great place. And so after I had volunteered that first um, week, Willie Gilsenberg, who was the president of the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, so for later fans, he was like the Jack Tunney of the time. Um. He, um, or Nick Bockwinkle at the time with WCW, <laughs> um, he was, uh, he said, Hey kid, that wasn't bad. Why don't you come back next week and put a tie on? We'll put you in the ring. I did it every week. And then I started to teach. I had been, I was a senior in college and then I started to teach and, um, I get a call. So I had moved out of the house to go closer to where I was teaching and I get a call from my mom. Uh, one night and she said, and I could tell there was something wrong. Like something was in her voice. And I said to her mom, what do you, like, what's up? She said, Gary, do you know someone named gorilla? <laughs> 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 this man named gorilla called <laughs> and he, cause I wouldn't know his name. I wouldn't know his real name. I, I didn't even know he was an owner. He was, a, he was a 25% owner of capital wrestling. Um, so I called him up. He says to me, Gary, he said, uh, I'm promoting and I would like for you to announce for me. I I said to him, I can't. He said, why not? (laughs) I said, because I just started a teaching job. Oh, he said, you can teach in the day and announce at night. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, (laughs) it's going to be in New Jersey, eastern Pennsylvania, Delaware. He had his own territory within the territory. So I said, oh, okay. So I did that for two years, every place from high schools and colleges to nightclubs to rodeo arenas to army bases to, you know, any place where you can gather people. And, and this was at a a time when gorilla had, who had been one of the biggest heels and biggest names in the sixties in the company, and then had become a baby face was kind of transitioning out of the ring entirely and, and starting to promote. And they gave him spot shows to promote in, in that territory. So he gorilla made a ton of money in the wrestling business if, yes. if, more than, than many people that you would suspect made a fortune. Gorilla monsoon made a, a mint. You're absolutely right. And, and he had a vision of retiring. In fact, I, I announced his retirement match and 
being an owner of the Northeast Territory because none of us could have envisioned what Vinnie, you know, wound up doing, you know, expanding. So uh, two two years went by, and I'm a little at, toward the end of the two years. They let me in the locker room. They started to trust me, and uh, I didn't know that he was the producer of WWWF TV syndication. So this was also July 4th weekend. It was two years to the weekend. He calls me and says, Gary, he said, uh, I want you to come into Philadelphia and announce TV. I said to him, I can't do that. <laughs> he said, well, why not? <laughs> I said to him, I wouldn't know how to do it. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know what to do. I've never, he said, oh, it's easy. You just have to face the camera the bell will ring, you talk, you get out of the ring. The bell rings, you get in the ring. You, so it was like, you know, the gorilla was teaching me how to be a monkey. You know, it was just like, it was, <laughs> we ring the bell, jump in the ring. So, um, God bless him. God bless him. So I, I, I pay tribute to Monsoon at my stage show. Um, and then, you know, I worked with the McMahons for 11 years. <clears throat> So it was, you know, it was a great beginning. And what, and by the way, for, for the people who, who might not know, when you, when you said Vinny, I mean, it's Vince McMahon, but you are one of the, the old guard who are still around, uh, who called Vince because that's what Vince senior called Vince, right? It was, Hey, where's Vinny? <laughs> yeah. That's how you would distinguish between him and his yeah. father. <laughs> yeah. And, it and probably when I over in Stamford today, say that again. I said it probably wouldn't get over in Stamford today if you walked in the board meeting and said, "Hey, Vinny, how you doing?" <laughs> Which would cause me to say it. That would that would even be more reason for me to have a good time. So um, yeah, so and and we did the TVs in the same place every three weeks. So I started out in the, at the Philadelphia Arena, this wonderful rat hole of a place. Oh, it stunk of urine. It was, it was the best. <laughs> the, the, the smell of urine and hot dog, like oil, cooking oil. Yes. It was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I think I probably just described hundreds of arenas at the time around the country. And you, you don't you, get that smell anymore anywhere. And you, and you can't, people don't know what it would even be at this point. They'd think, oh, there's a body somewhere. Yeah, but it, it was a, it was the wrestling smell. But uh, well, in the in the mid eighties, you you transitioned. I remember there was an issue with the uh, WW or WWF at that point, and you you moved over. You you changed sides in the war. Yeah, there really wasn't an issue. It was that um, Monsoon lost his shares when Vinny wanted to expand across the country. So, um, it was because of him that I had whatever position I had. And when he lost his power, I had, didn't have a future there. I, 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 you know, you start knowing that things aren't going well when they would cancel a show and they didn't tell you <laughs> <laughs> and you'd want, you know, you would arrive at, at a, at an empty arena that happened a couple of times. So, um, and then Vern Gagne and Jim Crockett got together. They formed Pro Wrestling USA, and they they moved into this area. And um, I had an opportunity to do uh, the first six months of the AWA ESPN show. It was um, I, th- I forget it was Monday or Tuesday night. It was um, an hour and a half of wrestling and an hour and a half of roller derby. Um. I remember yeah, yeah. that, and 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 the roller derby, uh, which I loved roller derby, but that incarnation managed to make even the last days of the AWA look fairly good. <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, you're right, and and it was uh, the first uh, six months was filmed at the Tropicana Hotel in Atlantic City, so once again that was easy. Um, but when they came in, um, I was still working for the McMahon's. And for a few months, uh, don't ask me how this happened. Don't ask me why it was allowed. But for the first few months, I worked for all three promotions. I would go to the Meadowlands this, the first weekend of the month, and I'd announce WWF Wrestling, you know, the live event. And then two weeks later, I'd go in, and I'd announce Pro Wrestling USA. <laughs> and 
Vinny, like I never heard from anybody, you know, no one ever said, what are you doing? You know, you're fired. I, I, you would expect that, you know. So I think I hold the distinction of being the only individual to ever work for the WWF, the AWA, and the NWA all at the same time. All at the same time. <laughs> and w- when and did they smarten up to it? How long did it take them? Oh, they had to know the first time. I mean, they would send Stooges out to the shows. And Well, how long did it take them to do something about it? They didn't do anything about it. I did never. Ah, oh, well, there you go. Because uh, I knew, I knew that I didn't have the best voice. I knew that I wasn't the best looking. I knew what my limitations were. But I also knew that the one strength that I did have was that I had a personality, and that I had an, I had a a bond with the fans wherever I announced on a regular basis live. And I thought this is ruining whatever credibility that I have. You know, to come in and say WWF is the best wrestling in the world. And then Pro Wrestling USA is the best wrestling in the world. And, you know, as a fan, you've got to sit there and say, this guy's full of shit, right? I'm, I'm not helping any promotion. So, um, and then the ESPN National, um, I, was, I was asked to do that. And that's when I made the decision of, I just stopped going to WWF shows. So I didn't quit and I wasn't fired. I just, you know. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> hey, but but it, it, in all fairness, they canceled shows and didn't tell you, so you canceled your announcing and just didn't tell them. I never looked at it that way. <laughs> I like that. I like that. That's good. Hey, I got to bring something up. You were there in your stage show. Do you reenact the famous night in Altoona? <laughs> and if so, have you corrected? I got on you one time because your your original, the original version of the book, I'm sure you've corrected this and, and sent corrected pages out to all the people that bought the first version. But when I whacked that guy in, over the head in Altoona with the tennis racket, the first version of your book said, oh, it was just terrible because he was an elderly, elderly gentleman. <laughs> and then yeah. I sent you the newspaper articles that he was, he was a, a fit and frothy 30-something. <laughs> yes. But he he looked like he was in his seventies. After mind I got 70s. finished with him, he sure fucking did. I'll tell you, because I'm, I'm a bad man. I'm a very bad man. Oh, no, Jimmy, I'm, it was it was, when I when I saw that uh, the way I describe it, it, it was like <laughs> taking a hammer and smashing a tomato. That was your racket coming down on his nose. It was like, oh, well, I had to, see, I had that's why like that that's why you couldn't tell what he looked like because there was too much blood on his face. And, and in but, fairness, in fairness, um, when ECW Press picked up my book in 2005, 2006, um, I said to you, and you did, I said, write the correct, correct me, you know, and I will not respond in any way because you were right. I just, I just thought the guy was old. And to all the, all the fans out there, I can assure you. You do not want to get on the bad side of James E. <laughs> but just for for the record, the guy that I mutilated and scarred forever in Altoona, Pennsylvania, when he jumped over the rail and tackled Bob Eaton, was was a, a, a middle aged person of of fine vim and vigor, and not an elderly gentleman. <laughs> yeah, and, and I <laughs> never when I read, you know when I read that I was like, "Fuck, Gary! Now you made me look so bad." <laughs> I n- and I never questioned. You know, that it was the correct thing to do. It was just that I got his age wrong. And, and if you remember that night, you know, the good old boys, that they were, they were in Altoona. They were uh, security. So if you remember correctly, you know, they, they were just taking this like it was a joke. And they pulled him back out. And I, we, we don't know where they took him. And then a few minutes later, he comes down another aisle. Yeah, towards the ring. The story yeah. that we got later on was they took him to the front door and told him, "Okay, leave." <laughs> he's ble- he's covered in blood now from head to toe. He's already hopped the rail once, and they just said, "Go ahead." And they turned on it and they came back because I remember the incident when it happened. Tommy Young was was not refereeing. It was it was either Nick Patrick or another referee because Tommy came, I believe, from the Dagum of. Uh, one of the referees came from the, the stage where they were watching and tried to intervene before the security guards even got there. But anyway, I just, I'm having fun with you because if, if when, when I'd seen you at a convention or whatever, and I saw the, you gave me the book and I read it the first time I was like, well, now, now Gary's made everybody think that I'm a abuser of senior citizens when yeah, really yeah. I was an abuser of a man appro- approximately the same age as me. 
and I'm I'm happy that you know we corrected it and got it straight, and <laughs> and, and it also says a lot about you that yeah you're forgiving. Well, like exactly. I, I did forgive you, and then we we've been fine since then. And no, we you know that was the one part about at that time. And and you know if you have any Jim Hurd stories, please feel free to share them because we've already made him look like complete fucking buffoon on this show on a number of occasions. But the one fun thing about WCW at that point was uh, a lot of us on the road, we were traveling in those ridiculous towns that they would run for no reason, where there'd be no people in the audience, and we were on the road all the time or whatever. We did have some fun, at least. Uh, m- m- most people got along with each other. It's just when the office people were thrown into the mix, there was turmoil. Yeah, and I, I, I didn't share a whole lot at the time because... I was like very protective. I, I like the, it was a lot of paranoia. Um, now I was not part of any booking committee. I was not part of any management. So I'm just talking about like a worker bee, the least important guy, the least important performer. Okay, on the road. Um, but I always thought um, when you remember uh, Don Glass. Yes. <laughs> so he was imported from WWF. He was Ed Cohen's assistant. And so because and for, of that, for, for, the, for the sake of all of the people who might not be following, Ed Cohen was the genius. Uh, one of the longest running employees in the WWF. He was the guy that booked the, the arena schedule. He booked the dates and the contracts with all the arenas. They're basically their touring schedule. And Don Glass was his assistant. And WCW was able to steal Don Glass away from the WWF and make him the guy booking the buildings. And as a result, we were in San Antonio in an 18,000 seat building on Easter Sunday with 800 people in it and numerous things like that. Yeah. San Antonio, the most Catholic city in the country. Yeah. Yeah. And an afternoon show too. Wednesday night, we'd be in Tennessee at the church night. Yeah. So either the guy was incompetent or he was sabotaging, you know, and I, you know, there, there were a lot of people that were, you know, they, they were some people who just thought he was, didn't know what he was doing, that maybe when he worked with the WWF, he was just getting donuts for Ed Cohen. And then I'm, there were I'm, others I'm who in, said, I'm in this that is so bad that he had to plan this. <laughs> but we, as we found out, when, when, when corporations get involved with the management of wrestling companies, People are found and put in positions where they really are so bad. It seems like they would have to be tried. <laughs> yeah, and and because we were the um, the unwanted um, department of Turner Broadcasting, we would always get like the secretaries no one else wanted. We would we would always yeah. get. There were a lot of wonderful people that worked there. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong, but there was a lot of incompetence too, and I think that was part of the reason. They were just people that no one else wanted to work with. Were you there the night? Did you do central stage TV tapings? Oh, yes. Yeah. You, so were you there the night that they booked the TV taping in central stage when, or center stage rather, when uh, they were renovating it and we got there and there was no seats in the building? It was just ledges and concrete dust? Mm. By the time I got there, they must have been seats because I don't remember that. No, that they, was, they, did they was, cancel that night or? They, oh yeah, they canceled. Yeah, they said, well, we can't do it. At first, they were going to say, "Well, let's just let everybody sit on the on the ledges, right?" And then it's dirty, so we yeah. did the taping the next night in Huntsville. But there was numerous times about. Were you on the uh, tour? I'll give up if you weren't on this one. On the tour of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and etc. St. When, John, yes, Halifax. When the ammonia yes, leak gas, the, uh, Lord, the Lord Beaverbrook rink. Is yes. Yes. We got to Lord Beaverbrook rink and, and, and there were all kinds of emergency, uh, vehicles outside and people huddling around. And I remember getting out of the car and going to the building and saying, what's up? And it's like, well, don't go in there. It's like, why not? Because you'll pass out. Why? Because there's an ammonia leak, and so or somebody unscrewed the valve in the middle of the night. See, it was those kinds of things where you'd have to think sabotage, you know? <laughs> well, and, and we'd been up there like four or five days, and that was the only good house we were going to have. <laughs> and, yeah, and, 
We were walking across the street from the hotel and we saw David Crockett. He's coming the other way. He's coming toward us. And he's just like waving us back. Like, no, no. What? What? Bobby, the second time we went over, Bobby Eaton actually went in the building and it, it immediately was like if, if you were just took the cap off a bottle of ammonia and held it under your nose. That's what it smelled like. And Bobby starts putting his bag down and sits down like he's going to start unlacing his shoes to get dressed. I said, Bobby, what are you doing? Have you ever seen a more dedicated or known a more dedicated person to their their work and their business than Bobby Eaton? And I have never I've never met anyone nicer. I mean, the only group he could be the militant leader of would be the Salvation Army. (laughs) He uh, yeah, he's he's special. He's he's a special guy. Who were your favorite guys to hang out with uh, in those days in the locker room, the, the WCW days? Um, Bobby would be one of them. Remember, Bobby would always be, uh, and he probably still is, like real squeamish about things. Yeah. Like you'd, you'd throw gummy worms at him and he would throw up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how could you not love, love that? <laughs> he had a, he had a, a very weak stomach. If you showed him a booger, yeah, that was it. Uh, what? <laughs> One time he actually, we, when he spilled uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken gravy and we mentioned to him how much it looked like baby shit, he started puking and it was his own gravy that he'd just been eating. And, and so explain to me, how could you take an individual like that and how did he withstand a scaffold match, for instance? How did he uh, withstand getting his head raked across a, a cage? Oh my God. Well, the thing is, It is weird. Bobby was not in any way squeamish about being in a bloody match or the bumps or the angles or whatever like that. But if if you were just sitting with him in the car or just telling stories and you would mention a booger or or a fart, a very pungent fart would cause him to, to puke. It it, it was amazing. It's, it's, it's a complete, uh, it, it was like a Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, it was a disconnect. I mean, I never understood. I, I never understood that. I would just, <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a sweetheart. So yeah, he would um, Mick Foley, you know, Cactus Jack. Every I traveled alone, um, and every once in a while, I would ask someone, "Hey, you want to join me?" And um, so Mick did, you know, a few times, and and uh, he was a he was a great great person to be on the road with. Um, there was one time in. Um, Oh, I think it was Kansas City where um, Bagwell brought his wife on the road with him, and he was supposed to share the car with Ron Simmons and Scorpio. And uh, he got there first. He rented the car. He and his wife took off. (laughs) So Simmons and Scorpio had no ride, and so we're at the baggage terminal, and and yeah, one thing about a lot of the guys in wrestling is they're not straightforward. You know, if you just come up to me and say, hey, this is the situation, could you help me out? Ron, and I love Ron. Ron is another one that I love. He comes up to me and he says, uh, hey, Capetta, who are you, who you riding with? He knew I rode alone. <laughs> I said to him, uh, nobody. I said, why? What's, what's the situation? No, I, cause I didn't know the situation. And so he, you know, he goes on and tells me that fucking, you know, you know, Bagwell took the, you know, the car and now, and, and now if we rent a car, we're going to have to pay for it. And he, but he took our car. So I, he said, uh, I said to him, well, you, you know, you can come with me, but we have rules. <laughs> <laughs> he said, what kind of rules? I said, well, number one, I'm not your chauffeur. <laughs> number two, like if you need to go to the gym in the morning, just, you know, take the car, but I'm not driving you to the gym. Number three, I Christmas shop like all year. I, I, I <laughs> gift shops, and <laughs> he said, "What do you mean?" I said, "I mean, like if I see like as this quaint little gift shop, I you know we need to stop and I need to shop, and I I, I do that all year. And then at Christmas time, <laughs> when I give gifts, I give I put a, a a map on the on the gift, and it just shows you where it came from." <laughs> I did that for years. Already Ron and Scorpio were thinking about how far is it if we walk? To this? <laughs> so, uh, so Ron sits shotgun, Scorpio's in the back seat, 
and day after day after day, there are more Christmas gifts that are going in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> and Scorpio's getting squished a little bit more, a little bit more. So one day, a teddy bear was his was his pillow. Another, <laughs> <laughs> you know, those are things that oh man, this is wonderful, wonderful memories. You know, it's the, it's the kind of thing that I share uh, when I go on the road with my stage show. So it's fun. well, and and I was about to, and conversely, when I don't know if if Ron and Scorpio are sitting there going, "Hey, boy, that was such fun." The time that we had to share the back seat with the fucking uh, teddy bears and his, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but when you, know you go what? on the go, go ahead. When I see them, when I see Ron and I see Scorpio at conventions or whatever, you know, we just howl. We just have a a really good laugh remembering you know, what went on back there. Because we were on the road for a week, and there was a, a, a huge storm, uh, an ice storm. And at one point, the car spun out. It was, it was like a, we were coming down um, an incline. And uh, all, uh, nothing, ch- I was driving, and I didn't put my foot on the brake. Or, it was nothing. And all of a sudden, the car started to spin. And thank God, it spun to the side to the shoulder of the road, and there was like a, like a cow pasture, so beyond the shoulder. So we were a good ways off the road, and the ground was all frozen. That wasn't the problem. The problem was every car that came over that little hill started to spin huh. and in our direction. And uh, thank God, you know, no one hit us. And, and Ron, was, he was sleeping. <laughs> Do you, do you think that woke him up? Nah, that didn't wake him up. It was, and I, so I'm elbowing him. I'm saying, Ron, Ron, because I'm frantic. And Scorpio was in another world. And Ron was sleeping. And he just he said, well, fuck, he said. Just, just put the car in gear. Let's go. <laughs> and that's what we did. He kind of calmed me down by, you know, indicating, ah, this is no big deal. Let's just move on. It, it was wonderful. Hey, and I've heard some stories about Ron uh, and Bradshaw traveling with Teddy Long, and so consider yourself lucky. Some of the things they've done to poor Theodore, that 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 Ron was uh, younger and kinder and gentler in those days. <laughs> you know what? I, I was through over through forty years. There have only been two times when I was ripped, and I was you know I'm kind of happy about that because I just think it's uh, I don't know I just think it's bullshit. Like some some of the ribbing isn't funny. You know what I mean? And it's like I wanted no part of it. Um, but, yeah, that was Mr. Fuji years ago. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, it, was at a, it was at a TV taping, so I, was, I, I lived three hours from the, where we did the TV in Philadelphia. This was WWF. And um, so when I finished, I needed to get on the road because I was in class the next morning. And um, he had, I don't know where he got all of these padlocks, but he would carry locks with him everywhere. And he would lock your gear to uh, a, a water pipe. He would, it was just like. A set of lockers. A, yeah. a set of, 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 of a, a big uh, of metal grating over a window in an arena that you could get a lock through, something like this. Something that it would, you'd have to take the building home with you. But I was lucky. I was lucky because he, I guess he liked me because he locked my um, garment bag to a chair, to a, uh, a yellow, a bright yellow metal folding chair. So I brought the chair home with me. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm walking through the streets of Philadelphia with this chair. I brought the chair to school the next morning and I sent a kid down to the shop to, you know, get them to cut it open for me. Um, and the other time was on a, a plane coming back from... Europe. And I want to say, and I, I was with Paul Roman not too long ago, and I, I wanted to ask him if it was him. Um, I had fallen asleep, and I was in the last row of business class. And the reason I was in the back, because at that time, you could still smoke on planes. So I don't know what sense it made, but you were, you were always in the back row. And um, so he stood behind me, and unfortunately, I fell asleep. And he, all he did was he, you know, painted my fingernails red. I mean, so when you consider 40 years and, and thousands and thousands of, of wrestlers that I came, you know, that I interacted with, I think that's a pretty good record. Well, you know, they didn't want to fuck with you because they heard it was told on TV that you were the world's most dangerous announcer. 
So so all all of these stories and many more can be heard on your stage show that we have mentioned several times and have yet to tell anybody where they can see it coming up over the next few weeks. Yeah, let me give you the rundown. Um, We start in Conyers, Georgia, uh, right outside the Atlanta perimeter on lucky Friday the 13th of October. (laughs) And then, uh, so Friday the 13th, you just October. you just you just laugh at danger and snack on death, right? Uh, and I just yep hit it head on. Um, then the next night, October fourteenth, Saturday night in Tampa, at the Tampa Showman's Club, and then the next afternoon in Orlando, October fifteenth at three o five, at Alex the Pug Porto's Training Center. In Orlando. Oh my God! Please tell Alex Porto that I said hello. It never ever got anywhere near the rec- uh, recognition that he deserved. He was a, a impeccable worker. Absolutely, absolutely. And then um, Asbury Park, New Jersey. It's like a coming home show to me. Um, that's Saturday, October twenty eighth, at the Lake House. Um, and then um, Louisville. Louisville the next weekend. Um, I'm going to look up that barbecue that you yes, told me wait, about. Wait, I, I said, Gary, when you come to Louisville, I'll take you to the best barbecue. Mark's Feed Store, the best barbecue. I'll take you there. I'll come see the show. Now you're coming to Louisville. I'm leaving to go to Florida. Now in November. <laughs> so, November 4th, everybody come in, in, around the Louisville area. All of you, Kentucky, Anna, come and see Gary, even though I can't. And it's, uh, it's at the Alley Theater it's down in the Museum District. Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, they they show porn there about six or eight <laughs> hours a day, and then the rest of the time it's a very, no. I'm kidding. It's a very it's a lovely place. <laughs> yeah, that's all you have to tell the people that I'm that I'm going to disrobe. <laughs> That'll really draw them. <laughs> I saw you naked one time in the locker room and canceled my check to prevent blindness. It was terrible. <laughs> and then and where then after Louisville? I wind up uh, the next weekend in Queens, New York. On uh, November the 11th, another Saturday night. And they're all small theaters. Um, nothing, um, a couple of them are a little bit over 100 seaters, but most of them are, you know, very, very small. Because that's all I need, you know. It's, and um, I like the intimate setting. I like the theater setting. When I do Orlando on the 15th, it's going to be the first time that I'm doing the show from inside a ring, which will be cool. Um, yeah, so... I'll be on the road, and I hope people uh, come out and see the show. It's gotten really good reviews from, uh, I did a winter tour to eight cities in February and March. So uh, they can find tickets on eventbrite.com, and uh, they can visit my Facebook page at my initials, GMC, the number four, real, GMC for real. And uh, all the links are there, too. So, Excellent, um, but, uh, and 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 as a matter of fact, uh, the, I understand that they're clamoring for you to come back to those cities you visited before, uh, come back there again because some of the people are still wanting to get some refunds after they saw the show. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Gary, <laughs> I'm so, I, I bully you, but, but no, I'm kidding. I just Josh, uh, but no, I, I encourage everybody too because Gary has seen more matches perpetrated live. Uh, in the last 40 years, then probably most people walk in the face of the earth. You tell some great stories and you've had some great interactions and who else can say that they had another man's ear in their hand? Absolutely. You know, it's at <laughs> least when it wasn't connected to the rest of their guy's body. Let's put it that <laughs> way. You know, I'm having someone, uh, work on some artwork for me to depict the world's most dangerous announcer. So I'm, I'm excited about that. I, th- I think it basically just take a picture of Dick the Bruiser and put your head on Bruiser's body. One of those old pictures where he's got a beer in one hand, a cigar in the other, and he had the belly out, you know, with the DB tights. And anyway, all right. we better we better get out of this while the getting's good. I think so far people want to see the shows. If I if I go any longer, they might not want to. But Gary, thank you for being on the program. Everybody, go out, check him out on Facebook. Go to eventbrite.com. Check out the live events. The book is Body Slams, the memoirs or memories of a wrestling pitchman or whatever the fuck the subtitle was, but it's Body Slams. Get it while it's hot. Gary Michael Capetta, the world's most dangerous announcer. And for another week of the Jim Cornette experience for Brian Last, who is who dozed off hours ago. 
and the aforementioned GMC. I'm Jim Cornette, sitting next to the lovely and talented Harley Quinn for another week on The Experience. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye. Bye.